work on this 2010 Ford Ranger and in a moment we'll be taking the wheels off and uh, showing you how to get at the bearings and repack, wash them and repack them with, uh, with bearing grease. Now remember before you start assemble all the proper hand tools, power tools and supplies that you might need. First thing I'm going to do since we've got it supported safely here now is remove the central cap. Sometimes there's exposed nuts on there that are chrome. You got to be careful with those. Now, And you can see that these are just regular steel nuts on there, so we don't have to worry about damaging chrome on the chrome finish on this. We're going to go right to an impact wrench. And what we're going to get to is the wheel bearing inside of this. Now, for me to take and remove the wheel bearings, I have to be able to remove the rotor. Now, in this particular case, there's a caliper and caliper bracket that's going to stop me from taking the rotor off. So I'm going to start by taking the caliper bracket off and we're going to hang it up correctly with some wire in a moment or a bungee cord. Okay guys, so now to take the caliper bracket off, we're going to actually turn key inside to allow the steering wheel to rotate. I don't want to leave the ignition on in such a way that the power is running to accessories, but I'm just going to unlock the steering inside to allow me to rotate it. Now there's a backing plate in here that when we rotate steering, it's not uncommon for people to grab it and pull it and it bends up against the rotor and that can rub later on. So be aware of that when you move it. And when you're done the job, make sure you've got clearance around the backing plate. You may have to adjust it to make sure it's clear of the rotor so you don't end up with a rubbing noise. So I'm going to pull that and turn it in one direction so I can expose the bracketing bolts. In this case, I'm not going to be removing the pin bolts on top. That's uh, caliper pins. I'm going to remove the bracketing bolts on the back. So I'm going to use an impact to make it a little bit easier for now. And so we don't lose those bolts, I'll take them out store them safely and we've got ourselves a bungee cord we're going to take the caliper remove it off the rotor and sometimes you got to pull on the caliper a little bit to compress the piston back in its bores now I don't want this to drop on the hose over here and damage a brake hose so I'm going to secure that the bungee cord in such a way that it can't fall off of there. And I'm going to bring this back. Now we got full access to the rotor and we can remove it without having the brake pads holding the rotor on. Now the first place I'm going to go is to remove the cap multiple ways. As I said, you can use a bearing cap removal tool for that, which we're going to use in a moment. Alternately, you can take a hammer and a little cold chisel from the side give it a tap, it'll come off. So we're gonna try this tool and see if this works for us. There it goes, I'll get this lip on the other side and you can say remove the cap nicely without damaging it. Okay, now before I take the bearings off, I don't wanna get the bearings contaminated when I remove them. So I wanna make sure that the working area where the bearings are gonna go is nice and clean. So we're just gonna broom off the working edge. Any sand particles that make their way into a bearing can really cause the bearing to fail prematurely. So you want to make sure you got a super, super clean surface here. Now, there is a cotter pin on here, and if you look at this particular one, the cotter pin is traveling through a hole, and it's wrapped around the end of the spindle. This has what they call a castellated lock, and we're going to remove it in a moment to see that. Some have what they call castle nuts, and they have little thicker segments on them, and they're meant to have the cotter pin wrapped around the front, and the second uh, length of cotter pin cut off and trimmed later on. So I'll show you how to remove that. We're going to use what they call a diagonal cutter or a cotter pin plier. Looks like a side cutter. Sometimes it's called a side cutter, but a little bit broader than a side cutter. It's a little rounder, and it's actually got a, a bigger relief or a back cut on the plier, so it can be used as a, as a leveraging style plier to pull a cotter pin out. So what we're going to do is just simply open up the ears of the cotter pin, and if you pop up the cotter pin a little bit and turn it a bit, you can grab the cotter pin and give it a pull out of its bore. 
And that works for all kind of applications with cotter pins, whether it's steering or suspension parts, ball joints, tie rods. It's a nice way to remove a cotter pin. Once you have the cotter pin removed, and by the way, you never reuse cotter pins. You always replace them. It's like a nail on construction. You use them one time, and then you discard them. Uh, we do not want a failure because of a simple five cent part. Now we're going to remove the castellated lock. If it was a castle nut, you wouldn't see the top coming off. And in this one, it's actually really adjustable. I can allow that castellated lock to be oriented in multiple places until we find the aligning hole position on it for later on to put the cotter pin on. Now I'm going to going to remove this guy, the nut behind it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is temporarily take this nut off. We're going to actually use this in a moment to actually remove the inner bearing seal. And this is a little trick that many mechanics use to uh, effectively take a seal out without harm to it. So I'm going to just pull this outer bearing off. You can see it tip out. There's a special washer that's got a key in it or a flat spot. In this case, sometimes there's an extra key in there. And it's meant to key into a flat spot on the spindle or a recession in the spindle so it can't rotate. This is a safety washer and it prevents that nut from rotating while the car is in motion and coming off and losing our wheel. So really, really important. You can't put that on without that safety washer. Now, I'm gonna actually take the nut and the bearing out and I'm gonna use that nut because now the bearing's gone back on the end of the spindle and I'm going to then pull on my rotor and I'm going to allow the inner bearing to grab that nut and I'm going to use that and tug on the on the rotor and when I do that it will actually catch the seal and pop the seal up the back and I can safely remove that. Now in preparation when you're repacking wheel bearings it's always really critical at this point to wipe the spindle area really clean, get all the old grease off and all the old dirt off and one thing we really got to watch is what they call the seal area or the seal rides. A lot of times people repack bearings and you don't properly wipe that up. You want to re really wipe that really really good. Check for rusting, check for damage to the spindle and notches and grooves in it. If there's grooves where the bearings ride you can feel them with your fingers that may be an indication that your spindle needs replacement. So this was nicely cleaned up. There's no damage on the spindle. And at this point, I'm going to take a little grease and I'm going to coat that so that part of it's done. Okay, we got grease in front of us right now, so I'm going to take a little bit of grease. Now, I'm not going to go crazy with this, but I want to be liberal with it. Like I kind of think like I'm buttering a sandwich here. And I'm going to run that around the spindle, especially where the bearings ride. That's mainly where I need it. And also around the seal lip. Now, my goal is not to create a whole pile of excess grease in places where it doesn't belong. I don't want to see this being caught by the rotor and swept up into the brake system. It's got to be kind of clean on the back side where there's no seal rub so it doesn't get the places it's not supposed to be. So it's perfectly in the zones where the seal is, perfectly in the zones where the bearings ride, and I'm not excess, excessive with it, but just liberal with the grease. Okay, now the next thing I want to concentrate on is cleaning the rotor inside. Now, this is also a time to do bearing inspection, but we got to get the old dirt out and the grease out of there. Uh, you can bring it into a solvent tank and clean it out. But I don't like to load my solvent tank up with a bunch of unnecessary grease, so I'd like to take a rag first and wipe the excess of grease and dirt out of there initially. So I get as much grease out as possible. Now if the bearing area, the hub area we call it, is nice and clean, then we can usually stop there and not have to go further in the solvent tank. But if it's really packed with a lot of dirt and debris that we can't wipe out, then I will take it to the solvent tank and clean it up really well. Now this bearing was repacked not that long ago, so it's in pretty good shape. And we're going to wipe that out really good inside. And I really want to get a good look at the bearing race condition on there. We want to look for pitting, 
discoloration. If they're browned or blue, that means they've been overheated. There's a lot of score marks or pitting in the bearing or actually surface material flaked off called spalling. Then we want to end up replacing the bearing. And that's a different video, but we're going to service and repack them for now. These look really clean inside. Nice smooth raceways. We'll check the back inner race and it looks great too. So we get a nicely cleaned up rotor hub. Okay, now we're over at the solvent tank. And in this case, we're using a water-based solvent. And what we're gonna do is put the uh, solvent motor on. And we're gonna use this product to wipe and wash each bearing really thoroughly. So what I wanna do when I'm washing bearings is wash through the bearings and continue to wash it till all the dirt is out of there. Now, especially with water-based solvents, it's really important that you get all the old grease out of there and make sure you're adequately irrigating it so that the water isn't being trapped in old grease. So we're just going to continually hose that through. If you're using an oil-based solvent, uh, such as Varsol, then you're not dealing with any water that can be left behind. So it may make clean a little quicker, but this is environmentally more friendly, a little healthier for you. And these work just as good if you take the time. So just really irrigate that through. You want to see a bearing that's half packed with whole grease when you're repacking. Now this one's come out really, really nicely clean. The product is working really well. And clean all the associated bearing parts very thoroughly. Okay, we're over at the ventilation booth. Now we're going to take our bearings and we're going to blow through the bearing off so there's no residue of solvent left behind or in this case the water-based cleaner when you're blowing off a bearing you want to blow through the bearing we do not want to let it rotate because it can cause a safety issue those rollers come out the bearing can spin 20 10 20 000 rpm those bearings can come out and really injure you or even blind you so be careful not to do that so blow through the bearing completely until it's dry and blow off the remaining parts as well. Okay, now we're kind of over at the table here. We're gonna repack these bearings, and I wanna talk about two different methods of repacking. One is to use a manual method of repacking, and the other is to use a grease gun. Now, the first place I wanna start is doing it manually, because most garages, if you were gonna repack one or two bearings, you're likely gonna do it manually. You're gonna almost create as much of a mess with a power packing method as you would by hand. For small jobs, uh, hand packing is often preferred. So when you're repacking a bearing, first thing you want to do is select a grease that is meant specifically for the bearing application that you're working with. In this case, it's wheel bearings. I'm picking a good uh, multi-purpose grease that has got uh, an EP bearing approved extreme pressure, high temperature uh, protection on the rating. Okay, so when I'm repacking a bearing, first thing I want to do is put a dollop of grease in the palm of my hand. Uh, in this case, I'm using nitrile gloves here. I'm gonna take the bearing and I'm gonna put the tapered part of the bearing upwards and I'm gonna tip the bearing edge into the grease and I'm gonna keep dipping it until the bearing shows the grease showing tailings coming out the edge of the bearing. And you can see over here, the tailings are forming. I'm gonna get a little closer to the camera here. And I'm gonna to continue to walk around that bearing until the tailings push all the way out now, many times I see people just trying to smear grease around the outside of bearings. The bearing will not be properly packed and you'll have bearing failure occurring as a result of it. So this has got to last thousands of miles. So you want to make sure the bearing grease all gets inside. And you can see most of that grease that was in the palm of my hand outside of a little bit that's now in the center is gone into the actual bearing. That's how much we were actually getting in there. And in a moment, you're going to see I don't really have that much inside the bearing center. So I'll pull that back out. And that remaining grease that I'm gonna have on there, I'm gonna run it all around. I wanna be generous with that. Remember, this has gotta go thousands of miles. So you just don't wanna to be too uh, chintzy on the grease on there. So I'm gonna temporarily set that down and do the other bearing the same way. Now I wanna show you another method of repacking using a power packer or pressure packer. This involves using a grease gun, a special tool that has uh, two cones on it. The bearing will sit with the taper up on it and the second cone will fit over it. 
Just tighten those together until they make contact. Now we're going to put a grease gun on this and it's going to, the grease will enter in the middle of the bearing and force this way out between the cage and the rollers and you'll have the same tailings coming out of the back of the bearing and you'll know when it's packed by looking at the tailings completely circling the bearing. Same kind of grease is put in the grease gun. I've got the high pressure grease for wheel bearings inside, EP rated grease. It's a camera so we can see the grease coming out. There we go. Now I'm going to put a little bit of extra grease in there because I'm going to use that grease that's contained in there. You can see the grease in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And once that's properly greased, we'll separate it. And the same thing goes with this bearing. We want to run extra grease around the rollers to make sure there's an ample quantity in there to run the duration of its mileage going forward on the road. So we'll take that grease that's inside, pull it out, run it around the perimeter of the bearing, add a little extra if you have to, but make sure there's an ample quantity around that. Now, this is what I'm getting to about doing small bearing jobs. You still end up with your hands in the grease, whether you're power packing it or whether you're doing it by hand method. Or... Now, what we're gonna do is put the bearings back in the rotor. We're gonna start on the uh, inner bearing, which is the bigger of the two bearings, but we're going to take some grease and we're going to run a coating of grease around the raceways, both the outer race and the inner race. We're going to start with the outer race first, or the inner race rather, put an ample amount in there. We can always wipe excess amounts of grease out. We don't want to be chintzy with this either. We're not filling the hub center. Sometimes when people do trailer bearings, they fill the center hub area, especially if they're trailers for boats and that sort of thing, because they want to be able to push prevent water from entering the bearing areas. For most car applications, putting grease on the bearing races, but not in the hub center. Most of that grease, when it's in the hub center, doesn't get back to the bearing races. Push that down, take your finger and push it into the bearing. I take the excess off a little bit. Then I run my finger underneath the bearing and I pull it up into the raceway. So make sure I've got a nice bed of grease there for the bearing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my seal. One important thing about lubricating seals, seals have to have grease too. So we're going to grease that seal lip on the inside. Take the excess away from there. And I'm not greasing the outside of the seal. I'm going to go grab a hammer and I'm going to grab what they call a seal installer. And I'm going to put it on the seal itself and tap it back in. Now some people can you can put this in with a hammer if you're careful around the perimeter, but you never want to strike on a seal on the inner area where the seal lips are because you'll damage the seal. Okay, so I'm going to take my hammer and I'm going to gently tap it down. I want to make sure that that seal is nicely set into its bore. And then what I want to do is I want to take a rag. I want to clean up anything that could centrifugally fly out I want to clean that up so it doesn't go into the braking area. I'm going to wipe off the outer perimeter of the seal, not the inner, inner seal lip area, but the outer perimeter to prevent contamination on my brakes. Be really careful when you're installing seals that you don't strike that little tooth ring around the outside. It'll, it'll end up impacting how the ABS system works, so be careful with that. Okay, now once the inner seal is installed, you can flip it over, repeat, on the outer bearing area with some grease. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure my hands are quite clean at this point, wiped off so I don't transfer that grease over the rotor surface. Grease on bearing on the rotor surface will impact how the brakes work, so if you don't want to contaminate that, I'll wipe off that grease on there. And later on I'll also take a product called Brake Clean, clean off the greasy spots so it doesn't transfer to the brake pads. Okay, now we're ready to put that back on the car. Okay, we're back at the vehicle now and we're gonna put the rotor back onto the spindle. Now just remember earlier we ended up putting grease on the spindle area where the bearings are gonna ride and also on the seal area. That's already been previously greased. So now we're gonna take the rotor, I'm gonna slip it over. Now careful here, we don't want to knock the inner uh, seal out of out of place, so we're going to carefully align it over top of that spindle, putting my thumb on the 
outer bearing. I'm going to walk it over the spindle. Now, the seal has to climb over top the spindle uh, part in the middle. So we're going to rotate this. I think we're home right now. Okay, so now once we've got the bearing set all the way back on the spindle, you can see a little gap that's formed over there. We can now take the uh, safety washer and the adjusting nut and put it back on. Now there's a couple ways of adjusting these. Every manual is going to give you a specified amount of torque to put on those. It's not really high. On these types of bearings, we're just needing to take the play up in the bearing and a tiny bit more. So one of the first things we do, if we do it by, by wrench method, is to choose the proper socket size to fit on that nut. There it is. And I'm going to use an inch pound torque wrench in this case. I calibrate it to zero and I'm going to run it over the adjusting nut and as a rule of thumb as I said every manual is going to have a slightly different spec requirement as a general rule of thumb you just want to take the play up add a little bit of down pressure on that so we're going to put about a hundred to 120 inch pounds of torque initially on that nut this is not the final torque this is just to seed everything and we're going to rotate that rotor to make sure that that bearing is well set now we need to back it completely free there's no load on the bearing right now, and we're going to basically tighten it up and add about five inch pounds of torque. That's not a lot. That's essentially about finger tight, good, good finger tight. So about five inch pounds of torque on that. At that point, we're ready to put the castle lock on there and put the cotter pin in. Now I want to show you an alternate method. If you don't have a torque wrench handy, a lot of mechanics with experience will get an idea of feel on a bearing. Remember, the goal is not to put a lot of load on that bearing because if you're running grease, it will cook the bearing from overheating it. So the goal was to just basically take the play up, add a little tightening to it, rotate it, and back it up so it's totally free, and just feel where the play is gone. You'll feel it come to a natural stop on there. So you're just going to have it come to a natural stop and just a little tiny bit of extra force on it. Not a lot. And then we're gonna come along with the capsule lock, find the castle opening with a hole in the spindle. Now, what we're gonna do is run the cotter pin through that. Now, if you have a castle nut, sometimes there's only one hole, and you'll find that you can't get the castle opening to line up with the hole. In that case, you do not want to go tighter. You want to slightly back it up to get the cotter pin in with, and be cognizant that you don't want to end up with play being established. But you do not want to over tighten these. The nice thing about castle locks like this is if one hole doesn't line up, another one will. And you just continue to adjust it till you find the opening that works for it. There we go. So with a castle lock, we're going to basically take our cotter, cotter pin pliers and we're going to bend them around like so. If this was a castle nut, remember you're going over the top, cutting the excess off, leaving it nicely overlapping in the spindle for safety, and cut the excess off the bottom. And sometimes what I do is I grab another plier to shape it. Slip joint pliers work a little better than these, but I want to tightly push them up around the spindle. I do not want these cotter pin ears Cap. And if they're sticking out, it'll grab the cap and it potentially could, could affect how that cotter pin is doing its job. At this point, we're going to take the cap. And what I sometimes like to do is I like to take a little grease and I add some grease into there to prevent corrosion. So that's also a good thing to do. I'm going to push this over top, tap it in. Now I'm going to use, uh, I prefer a rubber hammer to do this. So you don't have the plastic now, it will work as well. So a lot of these bearing cap removal tools will have a hammer on that. If you're going to use a metal hammer, tap around the perimeter on it so as not to collapse it. Okay guys, now we're going to clean up the rotor face and we're going to use a product called Brake Clean. You spray it on the face, I guess I got a little bit on there. Don't go overboard with this, but put enough in there to get the residues off and also clean the back, add a little bit to the back, rotate it. You want a clean face so it does its job. All right, so now we're cleaned up on the rotor face. We're ready to take the caliper back off. 
control arm. Carefully bring it over. Watch we don't put tension on those brake hoses. Slip that back over the rotor. Sometimes it's necessary to pry the pads in. A lot of times I'll just actually turn the caliper a little bit and the pads will walk in a little bit. From the caliper to the caliper bracket. I'll take my bolts right here. Now this looks like it had some Loctite on there, so I'm going to get some Loctite for these threads here. I'm going to apply it to that before I put them in. Okay, so we've got some Loctite here. Now there's different types of Loctite. This is a blue Loctite. There's red, there's green, there's purple. Each one has its own strength and is meant for specific applications. I want to warn you, stay away from the red Loctite unless you're needing a permanent uh, bond. And if you use a red Loctite, the only way to really get these loose safely is to heat up the fastener to melt the Loctite to remove it. If you use a red Loctite, the next poor soul to come along to remove it may risk breaking the bolt. So we're going to use a blue Loctite, which is easily removed. But yet it holds well enough to keep the bolts from vibrating loose. one down initially with a ratchet and then I want to torque these up. Really important to torque these to their proper specification. Every vehicle is a little different so always look up your spec requirement. That always try to go to a proper technical site. Okay. I'm going to use a click style torque wrench in this case. Just for the click. Now when you're using a torque wrench, you want to pull nice and gradual on it. Not quick motion on it. Nice steady pull so you get an accurate torque. Now I'm going to straighten out the wheel. Remember, we're going to check the backing plate. I'm going to make sure it's away from the rotor. I'm going to rotate the rotor, check my backing plate clearance to make sure I've got no rubbing going on. Once I've got that taken care of, I'm now ready to put the wheel back on. Okay, we're back, ready to put the tire on. So we're gonna lift the tire up, and lift with your, with your legs as much as possible. Put the lug nuts on. Now I'm gonna gently tighten these down with an impact. I don't wanna torque them with the impact. I just wanna set it on a low setting, I'll put it on several. Setting number one, the lowest possible setting on the impact. Hey guys, the tire's back down on the ground, so now we can torque it. Now, when you torque wheels, make sure you do this in a crisscross manner. Once that's done, you can take the hubcap, put it back on. Now be careful that some hubcaps are indexed to go a specific way, so watch for indexing. This one can go five ways, so, and it's on. And that's the job done.